and, and now we have Alente there full time for a couple of years, and that's great. So finally, we're going to hear from her. Let's get started. Awesome. Yes, thank you. Can, can you open our private chat again? I don't have it. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, and I'm so sorry for the slight technical difficulties. This is the, the nature of life in Nigeria, unfortunately. Um, but hopefully this will go on without any more hitches. Um, so yes, I don't know what Brent was saying about me, but I hope I hope it was some somewhat informative. Um, I'm a reporter. I've uh, been freelancing um, for the past uh, six or seven years now, I guess. Um, I used to live in Haiti, um, and then I did a, a global project for several years on women's health. Um, I was looking at maternal mortality and um, kind of cultural issues around pregnancy and um, why the, the foreign aid projects that were attempting to address maternal mortality um, were largely unsuccessful. And I looked at that in, in a bunch of countries. Um, and to do that, I was working with a really talented photographer at the time named Allison Shelley. Um, to do that, we got a lot of grants. Um, and I learned a lot about um, project-based reporting and doing reporting trips, um, which is something. <laughs> um, that it's something that uh, that I didn't used to be very comfortable with. I didn't I didn't used to like the idea of reporting trips, um, but I kind of learned how to do it in the past few years. Um, so I'm going to share with you guys some tips about how to do that, and um, I would love for you guys to you know ask questions throughout as we go. I'm going to just kind of walk you through the process of how you kind of get from finding a story to funding a story, to pitching a story, to you know how you function on the ground, ways to stay safe, selling your stories, that kind of thing. Because um, uh, I've made a lot of mistakes along the way, so it's, it's good to learn. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so let's get started. Um, generally, the first step to any kind of foreign reporting that you want to do, um, if you're going to be doing project-based reporting, and I guess the reason why I'm differentiating between the two is because it's a very different way of being when you live in a country um, versus when you're just going in a short time to report a specific story. When you live somewhere, you kind of get to cover anything you like um, because the, the beat becomes your, you know, your country. So I'm having a lot of fun now um, reporting on all different kinds of things in Nigeria. Um, but if you're based um, somewhere, you know, I used to be based in New York, and I would be traveling abroad, and you, you know, it, it can be uh, difficult to kind of cram in everything you want to do and, and, and have a productive reporting trip. So this is that's basically what I'm going to be giving you guys tips on how to do is you know when you're living uh, elsewhere from where your story actually is. Um, so the first step is finding your story. Um, something that's really helpful. I mentioned I was doing a lot of work on women's health. Um, it can be very helpful if you're going to not be based in, your, in the country that you're reporting on to have some kind of brand for yourself, some kind of lens that you're working on. Um, this is helpful both because then people kind of start to know you um, for that, but um, but also uh, also, you know, and so then it can be a lot easier to get funding and that sort of thing going forward. But also, it just makes reporting a lot easier. So if you're showing up in a country, um, you know, if you're showing up in India for the first time, you've never been to India, for example, this happened to me, um, you know, there's, there's a whole world to try to understand. But if at least you understand kind of what people are talking about when you get interviews for your stories, like you already know what preeclampsia is, you already know what, you know, different maternal health complications are, it can be a lot easier to, like, to very quickly um, kind of plug in and and uh, you know get your feet on the ground. Um, so you know people people have brand have kind of a lens or a brand that they look at. It can be thematic, it can be any kind of thing. Um, I know people who work on migration, for example. That's a really obviously a really hot topic right now, um, and it's. Um, you know that, that that can be a great topic to explore all over the world, and there's different permutations of that. Um, people can work on, you know, I don't know, xenophobia everywhere. That would be a good one. Um, so um, you can also kind of focus on a region is another good way to do it. I'm living in Nigeria, so I'm really focusing on Nigeria as a country, but I would eventually like to expand and kind of focus on West Africa as a region. Um, 
And yeah, so that's that's the first step. Kind of hone hone your hone your topic a little bit. I met someone who said, "Oh, I asked what she covered. Um, she was a new freelancer, and she said I like to cover underreported stories." And I was like, "Like what? You know, that could be anything. That could be anything in the world." Um, but um, I think I think in time it becomes easier if you have a specific brand. Um, then once you've kind of then it's really important to once you've found the general thing you want to be working on, you need to do lots and lots and lots of research before you ever leave home. Um, um, there, are, you know, there are ways to, you know, there are all kinds of resources for how to kind of understand your story. Think tanks, um, you know, Human Rights Watch is a great resource. Amnesty is a great resource. Um, there, are, there are small think tanks around every topic, basically. You know, I thought I know tons and tons of them that work on women's issues that you kind of stumble across over time. Um, you know, read these reports. There's all these PDFs that people put out. Um, I, I am very skeptical of press releases, I would say, um, but I love research. So if some, if you get, um, you know, if you get tons of emails and they're like, "Oh, we have the new product, and we're, you know, we're gonna end postpartum hemorrhage with this one specific, you know, panty that you can put on people after their after their, you know, their delivery," um, you know, the press release is probably pretty useless. But if you actually go back and read the report. Um, you, there's usually something really interesting kind of buried way back down in the bottom. The statistics can be helpful or, you know, they, they, they'll make some random passing comment to something that happened, you know, while they were in the field. Um, so, so that's, that's, you know, read, read all the way through those really long, boring reports. Um, that'll also get you a lot of cred when you, when you meet the report authors. Um, you know, follow the local press. Um, even though sometimes it's not that good, um, it's important to know what people are talking about. Um, so you can, you know, try to find out what the uh, what the newspapers are. You can listen to the radio, usually sometimes over the internet. Um, find blogs. Blogs are really important, especially in a lot of countries. I mean, Nigeria doesn't have a very. Uh, I mean, I read obviously the newspapers here every day, and I listen to the radio. But the the media scene here is pretty constrained in terms of the, like deep actual reporting. But there's really interesting online forums that you can follow to kind of see what people are talking about. Um, blogs are really important. Um, in your country, um, where you live, it can be really interesting to follow the immigrant publication. Before I moved to Haiti, I was spending tons and tons of time with the Haitian diaspora in Brooklyn. Um, they had kind of newsletters and newspapers, so those are really great resources. Twitter lists. Um, this is a really helpful resource, and normally when I do this, I show you guys how to set it up, but the internet's so shaky today that I don't want to do that. But there's a great resource when you're on Twitter, um, where on, on the side of your profile, you, you, can, um, you can click on something that says lists, and you just, um, it's a great way to organize um, your, your Twitter to make it, to kind of gather a lot of information and your resources. So basically, when you follow someone, you can just say add to a list, and you can have a list that's about whatever specific stories you're working on. So I have one right now on surgery, because I'm kind of interested in global surgery. You want to look into that soon. I have one on, um, you know, the internet and, and, and African art, because I'm working on a story on that right now. And, and, you know, I have one on Haiti. I have one on, on Nigeria more generally. So that's a great way to kind of organize and then just check it all the time to stay on top of stuff. Um, I always set up a Google alert for countries that I'm covering or topics that I'm covering. I've had a maternal health Google alert that I get every day for years. Um, so those are great ways to just kind of flood yourself with background information. And all of that's really important to do before you get into the field so that you don't, you know, so that you're not kind of an idiot when you're wandering around in the field. But it's also really important before you ever get thing, which is the next step. Um, Thankfully, in the kind of the new media sphere where media houses are dying and newspapers are kind of fading out and everybody's a little confused, um, there's a whole bunch of funding mechanisms that are popping up to try to fill the gaps in foreign reporting. Um, these all have different, um, all have different kind of qualifications and rules for them, but um, you guys will all have access to this PowerPoint, and I definitely encourage you to check out all of these links if you're trying to get funding to go and report these kind of stories abroad. Um, IJNet.org, which is the third one down, I probably should have put that on top. Um, uh, that is a great resource. They bring together tons and tons of different resources on, a, on, on their website. So you can just scroll through there every week or so and see if anything else has come up. And there's different eligibilities. They'll say this is just for European journalists, or this is just for female journalists, or this is just for whatever people interested in reporting on climate change. Um, there's all different reasons. So 
that is um, that's a great resource. Um, ICSJ is really good. The Pulitzer Center has funded a couple of my projects. They are, they they report they fund things on a kind of link basis. International Reporting Project has a bunch of different grants that you can get. Um, Journalismgrants.org is another one that kind of calls them together. The International Women's Media Foundation is great if you're a lady. Um, they just got, I think, $5 million from Howard Buffett to do reporting in the Great Lakes region. So there's tons of money that just came in there. So getting grants um, is a really, really great way to you know, to keep doing the kind of reporting that you want to do if, if your paper doesn't have funding for it. Um, um, the important thing is whenever, uh, whenever you're trying to get a grant, um, read the call for application very specifically. Um, you know, you can have one project idea that you use on different grants, um, but, excuse me, but you need to make sure that every time you apply for a grant, you're, you're writing specifically your proposal for what they want to fund. Um, otherwise, it's kind of futile. Um, and, um, you know, so, so if someone says they're, they're really interested in, um, you know, new media, for example, the International Reporting Project, for example, had, had something where they're really interested in new media. And so then for a grant like that, you need to make sure you're talking about your Twitter followers or how you're engaging with different blogs or that kind of thing. Whereas if you're going for the Pulitzer Center, their priority is getting your um, your story published in the biggest outlet possible. So in that case, you need to be emphasizing, oh, I've been published in you know the New York Times once, or I've been in Washington Post, or whatever it is. Um, the other thing is, you know, the thing to be careful of um, with with grants, <coughs> excuse me, is um, editorial independence. Um, it's really fantastic that there's all this money, all these foundations that are coming in and and um, funding international reporting, but there absolutely are people who are trying to um, kind of control what you report on and how you frame it, you know. Um, so everybody has their own lines on this, and you, but, you know, you should be having conversations amongst yourselves about it, um, you know, and amongst your colleagues to see what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with. Um, you know, I've gotten a lot of funding from the Gates Foundation because they were really interested in in, um, in women's health issues um, around the same time that I was, kind of accidentally. Um, but I always got the funding through um, through a media organization like the Pulitzer Center um, that has complete editorial independence. So I was comfortable with that because, you know, for example, the Gates Foundation will not touch abortion and is not interested in abortion. Um, they're they're just totally taboo about it. Um, and but they gave money to the Pulitzer Center to do women's health stuff, and I got funding to do an entire project on abortion in Nigeria. That was the first time I'd ever I ever came here, actually. So, in a case like that, you can be pretty sure that you know the money is is clean at least, you know, or, or they're not they're not influencing what you're writing because they they wouldn't want you to actually write on that at all. Um, so so that's fine. But there definitely are ones where they're like, I want you to write about how successful you know these different how you know ways that these projects have made change in this area, and that's, that's really borderline uh, PR, and, and you want to be careful with that. Um, you also, anytime you're getting a grant, you need to make sure that your outlet is comfortable with it. Um, you often need a letter from your, from your newspaper or your media outlet to get the grants. Um, so, um, you know, and your editor needs to be sure that they're okay with it. You often have to kind of credit the grant in the final publication and, and that sort of thing. For freelancers, this is a really important reason to have a good relationship with different outlets. Um, so definitely try to build that up um, over time. Um, okay, pitching. Once you've gotten your funding, <coughs> and um, okay, so I, I put this kind of ahead because with a lot of grants, as I said, you have to have a commitment from your outlet to um, that they're going to print your story um, before they you'll you'll get the grant basically. So you have to do the pitching before you ever get your grant to, to go, which can be really awkward because you're, then you're writing to your editor and you're like, okay, so I have this really great idea for a story that I really want to go and do for you, um, and you know, do you want it if it gets funded? You know, and then and then if you don't get the grant, you're kind of like, well, sorry, it didn't happen. That shouldn't actually be that embarrassing because you should, you know, that your editors should be embarrassed that they're not paying to send you, and you should always, always, always try to get funding from your 
editors from your newspapers. Um, I think it's absolutely ridiculous that that you know that papers and media outlets today don't fund international reporting, and it's really important to kind of pressure them to. Um, and I've actually found that the more um, kind of the longer I've been doing this, the more I actually can get my, my outlet to fund projects and I don't have to rely on grants quite as much, um, which is great. But in any case, um, pitching is really, really important for freelancers, especially, um, but everyone, obviously, you always have to convince your editor um, to, to, you know, why a story is important, especially when you're trying to cover something, um, you know, that, that maybe people uh, don't think is sexy or don't think should be in the paper. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm getting over a cold. Um, so it's really important to know your outlets. Um, don't pitch something that they've already done a big reportage on. Um, you know, before you're going to write to any of your editors, um, is, sorry, um, you need to know you know, just make sure that they didn't do like a big story on the very thing that you're talking about um, last month or six months ago even. Um, and if they did, be sure to write in your pitch, you know, oh, I saw that you did this really important in reportage on, you know, whatever. Um, um, uh, but I think I want to take it further in this certain direction or, um, you know, I think that it needs to be updated because of this, this, and this, or you really haven't done a personal angle on it, um, so blah, blah, blah. Um, the other thing is to um, know your editors, know the personality of your editors. Um, our, our different editors will have different things that kind of make them tick. Um, so if you know that you have someone who's like really interested in like innovative new things, you know that even if you're going to be doing like a really entrenched human rights issue, you need to like come up with something that's, that's kind of um, innovative and saucy about it or, or you know, um, or, um, you know, yeah, for, so, so for example, I was in the Dominican Republic last year um, doing a story on um, how um, the Dominican government had stripped the citizenship <coughs> of Dominicans who were born to Haitian parents. Um, it was an incredible story. Um, they, they retroactively stripped the citizenship of people who had been born in the country, um, grew up thinking they were D Dominican, but because their parents, people, anybody who had been born um, to foreigners since 1920 um, was was no longer considered a citizen. So all these people who had kids themselves, you know, had been born in the DR, then had kids in the DR, like lived and worked in the DR, didn't speak Creole, were suddenly told that they weren't Dominican, they had to be Haitian or nothing, and were basically stateless. Um, so it's a fantastic story, um, and it's actually something that happened, um, I guess it was, September 2013 is when the court case first passed. And I didn't go report that story until May of last year, actually, um, like a year ago right now. So um, this points to two things. Number one, um, your stories can, you know, there's always something deeper to report. Like a story is never really done. Um, so if you see something interesting kind of filter across, you know, your, your news feeds or your Twitter feeds or all these things that I just told you you should be monitoring about topics and stuff that you're interested in. If you see something filter across it um, and then it kind of like something newsy happens and it blows up, um, don't think that, that that means you missed it or, you're, you know, it's over. There's always more to go and do if you're reporting deeply. Um, so, <clears throat> so, and, and then there is kind of, I think there's beginning to be, I'm really excited about a, a kind of movement in news to, or in the media to have um, kind of more interest in these deeply reported stories that come later. There's a new um, magazine I learned about called Delayed Gratification, which does, um, it comes out three months after the, um, uh, or it comes out quarterly, I guess, and they'll write long form stories about an event that happened three months earlier which is just awesome because that's exactly what I want. I don't want to follow, you know, I hate following, you know, the newswire every day or the, the newspaper every day. And I'm like, oh, Malaysian jet, like, who cares? Just tell me what happens when you find it, you know, or when you don't. Like, just, just let me know when it's done. I don't want to read this every single day. It's getting too nitty gritty. Um, so anyway, there's things like, you know, delayed gratification. There's old, you know, favorites like the New Yorker. Um, and, you know, there's, um, uh, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of kind of movement towards kind of later long-term deep reportage. Um, so anyway, so 
on that point, just dig in and, and don't be afraid to report something if you think it's already happened. But anyway, um, then once you get around to doing it, um, um, the reason I brought that up, my, my, my trip to the DR, is that I went down with funding from Al Jazeera, um, I worked for before, they agreed to send me down there. Um, but when I was there, I pitched it to, um, I think, four of my editors, and I sold that story four times. Um, and I wrote, I, it was in The Guardian, it was in LA Times, and it was in <coughs> um, a small magazine called Aussie that, my, that a friend of mine is the editor of. And um, we, um, and, and basically the way that I did that was, let's see, well, yeah, okay. Um, this is this is one example. Um, but the way that I did that was I wrote to all of them, to all of my editors, and I was like, hey, I'm doing this story on, you know, this issue that happened in the DR, this is the background, this is what you've written or haven't written on it, or like this is how I'm going to do it differently. And because I know that each of those outlets has a different tone and a different interest, um, I was able to kind of just do a different version of the story, like a completely different version of the story for all those different places. So for the LA Times, it was kind of a love story about what was going on with this, you know, these people that wanted to get married, but they were afraid to because he had just lost his citizenship and they were totally in limbo. Um, for Ozzy, which is kind of this like, like spicy magazine, um, or they, they're, they're like to be kind of fast paced. It was about um, this young novelist who kind of became a, a total kind of firecracker, um, you know, opposition voice um, writing in one, you know, um, kind of established herself as like this strong opposition voice in one of the media outlets there when the media was often quite xenophobic. Um, and it was just a profile of her as a way to get into the story um, for, you know, anyway. So, so each of those different outlets, I just did a completely different story on. And, I was, and that was a great way to use all the awesome people that you meet in the field um, and, how, you know, get, get a lot of perspectives on the issue and also just get the issue into all these different um, outlets. And that's something that I've done for, for a lot of my projects um, when I was in... Yeah, Nigeria for the abortion story. We did that in five or six outlets. Um, and I think, I think further down here, let's see. Um, I thought I had here. Yeah, okay, so um, you guys are going to get a copy of this, so you can go back and look at it too. But, um, you know, this is an example of, um, I think I have three four examples um, of emails that I wrote to different editors um, about my story in Nigeria that I was working on with Allison. Just to show, like, you know, you can just write differently to your different editors, um, pitch it differently, and um, everyone's going to have their own idea, especially if you write in a way that's like a little bit open-ended. You're like, oh, I'm working on, you know, a story on abortion, and I'm particularly looking at how, you know, the urban in a changing urban environment, you know, the layers of religion and tradition and, you know, all these different things that are interacting with women's health, you know, I'm open to any angle that you're interested in around this, like, what do you think? And you start a conversation with your editor, they're all going to end up going in different directions, and it's just, it's just really cool. Um, that's a great way to find yourself, too. Um, and, yeah, oh, and then, and then the, the final comment on pitching is always, always just have an actual conversation with your editors. Um, it's so essential to have a real relationship with your editors. Um, if for no other reason, they're nicer to you. Um, people, you know, editors can be kind of, kind of very dismissive and rude in, in the current media environment. Um, you know, if you, if you don't know them, if you're just sending a cold email out, you know, you, you might never hear back, you know, or like people might start a conversation that just leave you hanging or, you know, or they'll just be really kind of just dismissive or rude or impolite or, you know, whatever it is, pay, not pay you well, forget to pay you for a long time. But if you actually meet them, um, you say, or, you know, at the very least, if they're on a different, in a different country than you, you set up a Skype conversation, um, then at least they like they answer your calls usually, or, or they're they're just like a little less rude um, if they've actually had a conversation with you. And especially if you've like sat down and had coffee, and they know that you're a person, and they know that you're interesting, and it can just be a lot better. Um, so always when I'm pitching someone, I say like, "This is a general idea. Is there a time that we can talk about it?" And then just set up a phone call to to um, to to really move the dialogue forward, and that's that's a better way to do it. Um, okay, any questions on pitching? 
have discussed so far. Okay, hi, I'm back, Elaine. Um, I think, you know, you there were some questions which I think you answered in part. Um, there was some concern by expressed by a couple of people about how you um, uh, how do you keep your independence? How do you manage uh, expectations? Uh, when you're juggling different outlets and different demands, let's say on the one hand from your editor, on the other hand perhaps with an NGO, or uh, if you've received a fellowship or some kind of funding, uh, and you essentially said push back, you know, stand your ground, uh, establish a relationship based on an expression of your independence and commitment to a story, etc. I mean, I think that maybe there's some feeling that in practice it's just hard to do that, to, to uh, juggle expectations between um, a lot of different sources. Uh, we had Anna Gatt ask, how do you balance commissioning newspaper, website, and fund project, et cetera, clashing interests, she says, no doubt exist, and, and these might harm editorial independence. Um, and then someone else asked, if you are embedded with an NGO or, or have been receiving a lot of help from them, if that doesn't establish some sort of quid pro quo. Okay, um, yeah, really important question. Um, independence is key. Um, I, can, can you take your, can you mute yourself? It's, it's echoing back. Oh, sorry, did you hear my mouse? Sorry about that, okay. Okay, yeah, that's better. Um, Okay, so so about um, having yeah competing expectations. Generally, I I haven't gotten grants that um, that had competing expectations actually, because um, I've you know what I was trying to emphasize is you really only want to get grants that are for journalists. Um, you don't want to be getting something that you know places you as an advocate or places you you know if you if you you know. I don't know. I've never done it, but you know, you could be funded by UNHCR. I know. I know people who do this. Who get funded by UNHCR to go and do a report on um, human rights issues or whatever. And if you're then trying to write at the same time a, a news piece, you know, that I think could be difficult because you're working on reporting for an NGO, and that and that is just a completely different thing. So I, in a case like that, I think I. Sorry, I think I lost you for a second. Are we okay? Um, I just wouldn't do it at the same time. I would maybe, you know, work on, you know, if, if you know, a, a think tank is sending you out to do a report for them, go and do that for them. And then afterwards, if you found that you have, like, some story left over that you can turn into a, a news piece, then, then do that. Um, in terms of embedding with NGOs, that's a, I'm really glad someone brought that up because I know that some, that you guys get funded at the end or you can, you can embed with MRG, um, to go and, and do this this reporting story, it's so important as a journalist that um, you know there are fantastic ways to use those resources, but you just have to be independent. Like you just have to be independent. So if someone is um, okay, so for example, um, Pathfinder uh, is an organization, a women's health organization. They invited me to a conference in Ethiopia, um, and I went, and they. Um, and they were very, you know, they're like, and, you know, report something and we're going to take you for two days before the conference to come and see our projects and we're going to show you this and we'll just take this, you know, we'll put you all in a bus and we'll take you out and you'll see this project in the south of Ethiopia and then we'll take you back to the conference and, you know, let us know what you write. And I was like, okay, I can't write anything based on, like, my field trip in your bus to go see your project for one day when interviewing people that you're putting me in touch with. There's no way as a journalist that I can publish anything on that, that is that is true. Um, if you're going in with an NGO, that's great, but you need to, well, I mean, it's, it's okay. It's not great, actually. Um, the best way to do it is to, you know, there, um, for their deep knowledge of the field and their connections, but you always need to go back and do your interviews when no one is around. Um, you need to, um, you, yeah, you always, you know, if you, if you meet someone with an NGO for the first time, set up a time to go and meet them at home when you're alone. Um, always have an independent translator. Um, you know, 
anybody who's funding you, before you accept funding from anyone, you need to understand, you need to agree with them that, um, that you can write whatever you want and you're not going to be writing along their, their expectations. So I think that's a really, that's a really important um, thing to kind of keep in mind and, and you know, definitely complicated if, if they're funding your trip. Um, but just make sure, yeah, like I said, that you're, that you are reporting out, don't just, uh, don't ever just use their connections, don't ever just use what they tell you, don't ever just interview people that they introduce you to, don't ever just um, believe everything they say. I've literally had NGOs, um, I know of NGOs who um, have put out reports that have been lauded in the media internationally based on research that they said that they did in this you know place in random northern Nigeria uh, not Nigeria India um, and you know it was so awesome and it seemed like so innovative and so cool and I went there and they literally tried to control everything they they um, they staged a training um, they said that there was a training going on that we could observe and um, we had our own translators and and he um, you know he but they were kind of translating for us as we did it and so they were um you know the people that were in the training were saying oh you know we waited to get married like i only have one kid like you know we totally believe in family planning all this stuff um you know this is how old we are and our translator um was kind of off you know doing his own thing and he talked to these people as 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 the ngo kind of scuttled us along to the next village you know or the next house um and afterwards he was like everyone in that and that interview was lying like that guy actually has three wives and five kids like and he said he's only has one and one you know and like the, those people that they said are not but that girl actually is married like they're lying to your face you know and um and and then and they were trying to and then they kind of shuttled us out of the village and so so you know so we went back um we, or we tried to go back i think and and kind of report it um independently but like you always have to have a way to, to just make sure that you're independent because you know the most important thing to remember is that your only loyalty is to your reader really like you know the well and and your sources um <clears throat> the the people who are sharing their traumas with you obviously you have to be incredibly respectful of that but the most important person is not your funder is not um you know the 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 highbrow sources that you're talking to the most important person is is your reader and you need to tell them what's true so yeah okay, do you want to take one more question or would you like to carry on yeah sure i can take another one okay we had a couple questions about establishing relationships with uh, members of minority communities when you're actually there on the ground on a reporting trip um barbara petrofi said when you report on minorities from the global south how can you build trust among interviewees if you are only traveling there for a limited time, one or two weeks, is it even possible? And there was another question again about, is it, I think it is really difficult to build trust as a reporter with a member of a minority group. Uh, there's just not enough time. What is the best approach? Can you provide some best practices? Okay, awesome. Yeah, that leads into what I was going to talk about next. So I'll just go on then. Um, in the field. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yes. Um, the most important thing, building trust is super important when you're doing these kinds of stories. Um, <coughs> I'm so sorry about this. Um, but, um, you know, yeah, because you really want to make sure that, um, that like I said, you're, you're reporting something that's true and that you are having a, you know, a good relationship with the people that you're reporting on as well. I really feel um, incredibly lucky, incredibly blessed to get to um, spend time with um, you know, survivors of human rights abuses. And um, I think a really beautiful part of our job is that you know, people, we get to kind of build trust with people and like be a vehicle or a, you know, a container of people's traumas. It's, it's just incredible blessing that we get to do that. Um, so the ways to do that well, I think, are, um, you know, you have to be um, open. You have to, like, energetically, you have to be open. Um, you have to, like, be, um, you, you can never be in a hurry. This is a really important one. Um, you know, even if you know that you only have, like, one day and you're, like, or, you know, well, hopefully you'll always have at least two days because you never, the first day is always, like, a little started. Um, 
when you when you're meeting sources or when you're meeting people. Um, but um, even if you know that you don't have that much time, like once you're sitting down with someone and you're talking to them, you need to just just don't rush them. You just need to like be have your interview be a conversation. Like trust that these people are people and um, they're interesting as people. Um, in addition to the story that they have that you're trying to get about this trauma that they have or this issue that they have, um, you know, <clears throat> Catherine Boo is a really fantastic author. Um, and she has this beautiful quote that I think is about, uh, that, that I try to kind of keep in mind philosophically when I'm reporting. Um, and she says, when I pick a story, I'm very much aware of the larger issues that it's illuminating. But one of the things that I, as a writer, feel strongly about is that nobody's representative. That's just narrative nonsense. People may be part of a larger story or structure or institution, but they're still people. Making them representative loses sight of that which is why a lot of writing about low-income people makes them into saints, perfect in their suffering. Um, I mean, I think, I think people can tell if you're trying to turn them into like a two-line character. Like, oh, this is a, <clears throat> you know, this is a poor woman who is suffering because she doesn't have access to a health center in rural Nepal. Like, that might be true, but um, nobody is just that, right? So. You know, when you're in your interviews, like, just take the time. Get to know how many kids do you have? Like, who are they? What are they like? What do you like? What is your, you know, what are you doing today? You know, just, like, have real conversations with the people that you're interviewing. And that can kind of help to, like, open things up. Um, that's, like, a kind of, you know, philosophical approach to it. But more tangibly, um, it's really important to have a fixer. Um, and building on what I said earlier, it's really important to have your own fixer. Um, <coughs> not someone who's with the NGO. Um, you need someone who's independent and who's working specifically for you um, so that, you know, they can, um, you know, you can trust them. Um, and fixers, translators, those are people who um, I always become really good friends with uh, you know, when I'm in the field with them usually because, you know, you're with them for every day, all day, dragging them along. Um, and you kind of need to get them on your side um, to, to make it really work. Um, um, so I used to, I, I kind of by default used to become friends with my fixers. Now I kind of really try to become friends with my fixers. Um, and, and they can really act as it as not just a translator, but a cultural liaison. So you want someone who is also like really warm and like loves where they're from and, and, you know, loves their own culture and also is open to, to, to yours a little bit. So they can kind of, they're the ones who, um, can, can really, you know, make the mamas feel comfortable, like really make make the, the elders, you know, explain to you what order you need to meet people in the village that you're going into. So in India, for example, if I wanted to report on childbirth, which they did, um, I needed to meet with like the village chief first, and then I needed to meet with, and then he needs to, like we have to sit and have tea with him. And if he agrees, um, then I have to meet with like the father of the head of the family. Um, and if he agrees, then I get to meet with the husband of this this girl that I want to meet, um, and and the mother-in-law. And then if he agrees, you know, and they agree, then I can meet with this girl, you know, and like maybe have a conversation with her. So um, there's always, you know, in Nigeria, if you want to meet with a community, like you need to go and see the Oba, which is like the the you know traditional ruler in the in the area before you can go and. Um, um, before you can really do anything well. And you also need to kind of meet the area boys. You need to meet the people who are kind of the informal police in the area so that they know that you're there and, like, they're okay with it and everybody's in line. And if you don't know, you just kind of bumble in and then peep, and then you can really be stepping on people's toes. Um, <coughs> so, um, so a fixer can really help you do that. So on a way to find a fixer, um, there's all different ways. One is um, there's a resource on Facebook called The Vulture Club. Um, um, so if you, if you want, you can add me, I'll give you my email afterwards and you can ask me to add you to it on Facebook. Um, that's a great way. It's just a place online. It's like a message board where people, um, can, can say, Hey, does anybody know a good fixer in anywhere in the world? And people will usually know. Um, light stalkers, um, is another great resource for photographers. There's, there's a whole bunch that are kind of coming up now. Um, there's one, I, uh. 
Yeah, I mean, there's there's a ton of online resources, which is a good way to find a fixer. But your fixer is really like your best friend for for gaining trust, gaining access. Um, but the other thing is, don't just trust. Don't just get one fixer and believe everything they say. Don't forget that your fixer is like is a person who comes from a specific background, social strata, belief system, just like every other person that you're meeting. Um, and so they're gonna, you know, everybody, you know, it, you know, in Nigeria, for example, where I am now, everybody will tell you exactly how it is and why it is that way. And you know, they, a lot of the narrative is often true, um, but everybody comes from their own specific idea. So some people will be like, oh, you definitely can't go there, or like, oh, those people, they do that because of this, you know. And if you don't, um, you know, when you're brand new in a place, you don't always really know um, which of the stuff is, is basic common knowledge that everybody agrees on in a place, and which of the stuff is just someone's kind of personal take on things. So it's really important that even if you have a great fixer that you trust and you become friends with and like really helps you analyze everything that you're doing, the one who's like, hey, take your shoes off or like, you know, all these different things, that you also understand that like they are a person with their own kind of background and history that they're bringing to everything they're telling you and you, you know, don't rely on them too much. It's like the, the taxi driver that everyone quotes in every story and then, you know, you know that that's just their driver and it's some guy who's like pontificating and you think he's just the man on the street, but he's actually this taxi driver that has a very specific political agenda and, you know, so anyway, um, that's great. Um, then, yeah, other ways to build trust, um, you know, know what you're talking about beforehand as best you can, so do a lot of, you know, like that's why it's really important to do as much of your background ahead of time as you can. Um, you know, you can do a lot of expert interviews even before you get into the field. You can kind of set up Skype calls with people. Um, it, it can be hard, but but you can do that before you go um, and do all your background reading before you get into the field. It's like a big mistake. I mean, I've done it, and it's kind of fun when you're like in the field in the Congo. You just found a new story that you didn't know you wanted to report before you got there. So you're up at like 6 a.m. every morning reading like academic research papers, and then you're out in the field by 8 o'clock, and then you're out all day, and then you're like meeting people over drink. But it's exhausting. Like do your research before you go, especially if you have a very short time. Um, and and yeah, just the most important thing is what I said first is like really get to know your characters um, as people, um, and that I think I think that that just kind of helps people open up if you're actually interested in in all different aspects of them and not just what is useful. Um, for your story, just get to know people as people. Um, all right, what else? Oh, I skipped over um, safety. This is a really important kind of section to make sure you get in there. There's all different kinds of safety to think about. Um, freelancers, um, you know, staff people used to get funded to go and do centurion trainings and get trained um, in, in kind of hostile environment trainings and that sort of thing. There's a lot less funding for that now, but there are some really great organizations that are coming up to do that and kind of fill that gap. Um, and I didn't, I didn't realize how important that was until um, you know I've had, I've had experiences in the field where I was just like, holy shit, um, I can't believe, you know. Well, every time I've taken a training, I'm like, wow, I can't believe I didn't know that. And I was like wandering around northern Nepal, like hours, like you know, a twelve-hour walk from any hospital, and I didn't know how to make a, you know, a, you know, a sling, you're a, what do you call it, a stretcher for my colleague, you know, if, if we tripped and fell and we had to get down or whatever it is, you know, I didn't know how to, you know, pack a bullet wound. Um, um, so, sorry, um, you know, for example, I mean, uh, Tim Hetherington died, you know, in Libya because his colleagues didn't know how to pack up a bullet wound, basically. So, um, really, really important to take these kinds of trainings. Risk is an excellent one. I've taken their trainings. Um, they are doing them all over the world now, so go on to risktraining.org and see where they're coming up. Um, they're free for freelancers if you if you give a good reason for why you should do it. Um, Journalistsecurity.net I've taken to. They also subsidize it. Um, for other kinds of um, safety, there's all kinds of safety. You know, you need to be, it's not just packing wounds. Um, it's also, um, you know, knowing knowing kind of how much a place clamps down on journalists, um, how safe you are to ask questions, take pictures, um, what to do if someone decides to throw you in jail for doing your job. Um, so for those kinds of things, CPJ are really great. Um, um, RSF is really good. Board is up borders. Um, the Frontline Freelance Registry is a new online organization for people who are freelancers. 
Um, and uh, want to ask a question, Brent? <coughs> uh, yes, we have a few questions uh, piling up, and I thought maybe you want to okay. take um, a break. You let me do a walking break so you can recover because of your cold. Um, <laughs> I know it's terrible. Yeah, we had an yeah. interesting question asked by two people, by Ivana um, and Berta. Uh, and they were both saying, well, look, um, what happens when you have an interview with someone in, in, say, for example, in a minority group, indigenous community? Uh, this does happen um, fairly often. And they want you to pay for the interview. They want to uh, get some kind of financial reward out of it. How do you deal with that? Great question. Um, a tough question. It happens all the time. Um, <clears throat> how do I deal with that? Well, I really believe pretty strongly that you can't ever pay anyone for their story. I get, um, not only is it journalistically unethical, it does really change the nature of the relationship that you have with someone if you're paying them. Um, so just because, you know, if someone's paying you, you kind of want to please them. And so you're going to say what they, what you think they want to hear. Um, so, uh, how do you deal with that? I mean, I just make it very clear up front. I, I say, I explain beforehand um, why you can't, why I can't pay you. Um, I explain, I've explained to people in I don't even know how many languages, like, what it even means to be a journalist and why we have to be independent and why I can't pay you for your story. But, you know, I, I would so appreciate um, if you share your story with me and this is why it's important to do that. Um, you know, I mean, when I was in Haiti, I was I was working with girls. I was like, "Do you know what a newspaper is?" And they're like, "No." I was like, "You know the radio?" And they're like, "Yes." Okay, I'm like, and "So what I'm doing is like the radio, except that it's you know written down instead." And you know, so you know, we're doing it's you know it's news. It has to be um, different. I mean, I've explained to people how if if you pay them, you know, it kind of changes the story, and there's just no way to do it. So um, most people are okay with it eventually. Some people like really, really aren't. There was this one midwife in India who like was negotiating so hard and she was really interesting because she was one of these characters that was like a really interesting character in her own right. Also a really important connecting character because she was the main midwife in this tiny town. Um, she was the one who birthed everybody and all the animals. Um, she also worked in like a local hospital on the weekends or part of the time and uh, she was like, oh my gosh, like I can get you so many 14 year old pregnant brides and like I know everybody's going to have a baby thing. We're like, oh my God, I need it so bad, you know? And she's like, yeah, well, you have to get me a TV. You have to buy me a rickshaw. You have to buy me a cow. And you're just like, I can't do that. Like, I really, really can't do that. Like, no, I mean, I, I actually can't afford to buy you a rickshaw, but also like, no, I can't buy you a rickshaw in exchange for, you know, girls going to labor. Um, that's just, that's just so dirty. You can't do that. Um, so yeah, we kind of stuck our ground on that, and that was actually really hard. Like she, she wouldn't. We had to find another way. Actually, we had to kind of go around her, and and we we did manage to, and we still kind of interacted with her. And I actually, I actually wrote a story about her. She's this really interesting person. Um, but um, but yeah, you kind of you just kind of stand your ground with it and really explain it to people. I mean, just just yesterday, I was hanging out with these these uh, tanker drivers from um, northern Nigeria. Um, there's a fuel scarcity going on right now, and so it's kind of just hanging out with the people who are waiting, waiting, waiting to, for the ports to kind of open up because there's not been any fuel imported. So, um, and you know, at the end, he's like, "Anything for the boy? Anything for the boys?" And I'm like, "Oh, sorry, you know, like I used to be better, I guess, about explaining from the very beginning that I'm not going to pay people, but now I just kind of, I just kind of start talking to people and you don't even realize that you're doing an interview, and so then at the end." Um, or maybe they don't even realize we're doing an interview. We're just having a conversation, you know. Um, and so then at the end, he's asking for money, and I was like, no, no, sorry, like I'm media, like I'm not allowed to do that. So you know, I don't know. I've managed to explain it to people um, all over the world, and and uh, I've I've never paid anyone for their story, and I've managed to get a lot of stories. The thing is, though, I do um, I do buy people lunch, you know, or um, bring little gifts. Um, I'll you know like in India, like. <laughs> we were working on a document. And we'd be like, okay, we have 
yeah, you know, you'll go and have store um, just just small things, and you know, at the end, sometimes I'll, I'll you know, I give someone baby clothes, you know, for their baby if they've shared their story, that kind of. But um, uh, but that's that's it's always you know just just a token. Okay, we're, we're on the subject of uh, money, and um, there's a question about paying fixers, uh, which one normally does. Um, how do you, uh, it says, well, I, I guess, do, does the fixer has to be paid for his help? I think the answer would obviously be yes. Um, could you maybe talk about um, how much and how you decide uh, how to compensate the fixer? And then there was a, a related question, um, how do you decide whether the fixer is the fixer is, quote, professional enough to help you? And last, yet another question, um, uh, is it easy to change a fixer in the field? Easy to change a fixer? Like, change to a different fixer? Yeah, I suppose. If I just want to clarify what they mean by that, that'd be great. If you have to change horses in midstream, I suppose. Yeah. Um, great questions, all of them. Fixers, um, how do you decide if a fixer? Well, OK, number one. Um, uh, like even before we're talking about fixers, when I like now where I live in Nigeria, I talk to everyone about what I'm working on. Um, like I'm like in the bus, you know, and people are like, "Oh, what do you do?" And you're like, oh, "I'm a writer," and they're like, "Oh, really? What are you working on?" I was like, "Actually, I'm working on a story about you know, you know, gentrification and the changing, you know, architecture of Lagos right now." And they're like, "Oh, that's so interesting! Like my dad is a real estate agent, and da 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 da, you know." So um, when you're in the field, talk to everyone because everyone becomes your fixer, your unpaid fixer, just your source. Everyone is a source. Um, don't ever like. There's no reason to be like. Well, I mean, sometimes if you're working on something that's really kind of dangerous, but even if you're working on something really controversial, like you know, oh, I'm working on abortion. People are like, oh, really, you're working on abortion? Oh my god, I. Blah, 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 blah. And then then you're like, really, like, why do you feel that way about it? You know, and then you get so much stuff. So. So everyone can be your fixer. Everyone can be helpful. You know, like it's, it's. I mean, it's just insane. Like there was a really annoying guy who was hitting on me in the grocery store two days ago, um, and I was like, oh my God, this terrible man. He's so disrespectful. You know, I, like uh, no, no, no. And, you know, but I'm not being. You know, but I'm trying to just be polite. And then he's like, oh, you know. I'm like, oh, what's your name? You know, and he's like, oh, my name's Abdul. I work for the National Petroleum Company. And I was like, oh, really? I'm working on fuel right now. Like, actually, I do, you can have my number. Like, that's fine. So everyone's your fixer when you're actually in the field. Um, for someone that you're actually going to pay to be your fixer, um, um, how do you decide what to pay them? The best strategy is to ask them what they want to be paid. Um, I find that that's the best thing to do. Or um, because if I've worked with fixers, fixers, you know, people I've paid to take me around and help me on stuff. Um, um, I've worked with people who charge twenty dollars a day if they're like a fixer that's basically, you know, a glorified area boy, um, someone who is living in a slum and happens to be, you know, one of the ones I'm referring to specifically. He was like the son of one of the chiefs in a you know slum community that I was working with. It would have been totally absurd to pay him $100 a day because, like, no one in that community brings him that kind of money, and it would have just kind of really affected the, you know, his reputation in the community, the standing, you know, what people were expecting of him in the community. So, um, you know, so the best idea is just to ask people. Um, <clears throat> when you do that, um, there will be people who will say, oh, I work for CNN and, and the New York Times, I cost $300 a day. 300 bucks a day, I think, is the highest I've heard. Um, you should, you probably don't need that. Um, most places that you're going, you probably aren't working on anything that's like that top secret and difficult to get into that you need to pay someone that's that, that is that elite. Um, um, I'd say the going rate around the world is around 100 bucks a day. Um, but again, just ask um, because if you if people if you ask people their price, um, they they'll they'll tell you what they're comfortable with. Um, can you change fixtures in the field? Yeah, definitely. Mm. Um, I often, yeah. I mean, let me think. Um, this depends a lot on on where you're reporting, um, and so <clears throat> in India. I made the mistake of 
um, going to a random tiny town called Bodhgaya, which is where the Buddha attained enlightenment, um, randomly, where I was based for a few months, um, and trying to find a female translator there. Um, it took like two weeks to find any woman there who spoke English um, because it was that remote and that kind of, um, you know, uneducated of a place. Um, so I've learned that when you're going to remote areas, and always great if you can talk to somebody who's worked in the country that you've been in, um, that, you're, that you're going to, because they can tell you stuff like this before you go, um, but like ask, can I find a translator in XYZ town um, or XYZ part of, part of the country? Um, you know, so like in, in, in Nepal where I was working after India, I'd learned that there are parts of the country where you definitely can't find someone. Um, <clears throat> so before I got there, I knew that I was going to be working in far western Nepal, and so I asked, um, there was one NGO that was being really helpful kind of setting us up before we went, um, like helping us find accommodation and that sort of thing. Um, and they and I asked them like, what, you know, do you think we can find a translator there? Should we bring someone in? Do you know anybody who'll be there? You know, whatever. And they were like, you definitely need to bring someone in that case from um, from Kathmandu. So and they they helped us actually find someone, which was really great. Um, she wasn't even a professional fixer. She she'd worked as a translator before. She was um, a PhD student um, who was on vacation, and um, but she was doing research in, in public health, and she was awesome. So don't always just go through. The journalist route, actually, I mean, I have to say, it's like a lot of my very best fixers were not like professional journalistic fixers. Um, I had an amazing one in Mexico who was like a um, super fierce feminist, but um, who works like in like the tech industry. Um, but she was just really into our topic, and um, she came along, and she was just absolutely incredible. It's like you can, when you're new too, like people are a lot more like really like you know, try to do a really good job usually. Um, I'm gonna have a lot of energy, so um, definitely just ask everybody. Like, hey, do you have someone? You know, someone who's free and who can translate, um, and and meet your fixers before you go out into the field with them. Definitely make sure you click with them. Um, but yeah, absolutely, you can change the mid stride. I changed my fixer mid stride in um, Congo. I, in in Nigeria, for example, I have. I don't actually really work with fixers that much now that I actually live here. It's, it's kind of different, but. When I was here the first time, we had a different fixer in uh, in most neighborhoods that we worked um, because neighborhood hierarchies are so different here that you know you could. There was one fixer that we um, were recommended before we came, <coughs> um, who wanted to charge I think like I don't know like two hundred bucks a day, and he had worked for like everybody in New York Times and all this stuff. And everybody was like, oh, he's so amazing, and I found him super annoying. Actually, he was just taking like he was just like oh you have to like write this official letter to get this official thing to get into this official thing let me like call this guy that I know knows this guy knows this guy knows this guy to try to get you into that slum we're just like yo we only have six weeks like we don't have time for this you know um and and we would just kind of go to these you know to the hospital and meet a doctor who helped us out and you know got us past all of that kind of bureaucracy that he was buying into so we found him not very helpful and the people who were really great ended up being people like you know the um the Oba's son in this slum who, you know, we knew an NGO that worked in this community um, and we were like, do you know anybody who can help us translate? And they were like, oh, uh, you know, not not anybody working for the NGO at all, just 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 by being in this community, do you know anyone who speaks good English, basically? And, um, and they were like, oh, try this person, try this person. And, you know, this guy ended up being super energetic and really great and like, going around with us everywhere there, but he would have been completely useless in the other neighborhood that we were working with. And so like in another neighborhood, we found someone who had been doing research in that neighborhood the year before um, and knew everybody there, but she wasn't, she was, she had finished that project um, and she was our translator there and she was super amazing. So, you know, and like there are people who can be really great translators for when you're in the Muslim community and like not very helpful when you're in the Christian community because they're kind of, you know, they're kind of divisive. So. Um, Absolutely. Um, yeah, and in the Congo, I was there last year with um, the International Limits Media Foundation. Um, they had a few fixers set up for us, and um, I just, I just, we, we was, I was pretty frustrated with them. Like, they, we just weren't really clicking, and felt like they were just kind of like, oh, yeah, women. Uh, Talked to this one female activist I know of, and I was like, that's, that's nothing. She doesn't not working on anything that I'm working on right now. Like, can we please, you know? 
Um, but then one day, they we were going um, out to um, this this um, uh, refugee camp, and um, IWMF um, kind of dissociated with us for going there because um, they just made us kind of sign that we that we wouldn't sue them if if something happened because we had to go through a red zone to get there. Um, and so they they gave us they put us in touch with other fixers because um, they didn't want us to go out with their fixers for that. Um, and um, and I happened to like really hit it off one of the guys. And he again he was someone who was brand new. Um, I think he I don't I think he like translated as like a guide before, but he wasn't really a fixer before. And um, and we hit it off, and, and you know we decided to hire him for the, for the time we extended our, our stay. So you can absolutely um, change fixtures in the field. Um, and you know, yeah, honestly, the ones that are internationally connected are are um, often are I don't know, not not always the best. Um, the best way to find it are, are, to, are to know people who um, are working in the area and can find you. You know, so much work, but with, um, but oh, and we, I think we mentioned this earlier. Working with local journalists is another really, really, really fantastic way to to, to find work fixers and and to have like a dynamic fixer relationship. Um, I've paired up with, I mean, even like not as a fixer, I've just paired up with um, local journalists who are working on the same stuff that I am um, here in Nigeria, and that's super inspiring because then you're you're calling, you're like, hey. We have Court case today. You want to come and do this, and and then the the story is getting out in the local media, which is really awesome and always really important. I think, um, and and I've also hired people who are local journalists. Um, you know, to, to you know, if they um, in Senegal, she's she's one of my really good friends still. Um, a former journalist who who had um, was was on vacation, like came on a whole trip with us. Um, so that's another another great way um, to to connect with fixers. Yeah. Um, were there more questions, or shall I move on to writing? Um, Elaine, do you have a lot left? I mean, um, we have a couple more questions, but maybe because we, we only have about 15 more minutes. Um, maybe you want to carry okay. on. Um, carry on for a little sure. bit, and let me know. Um, maybe we could save time for three or four questions at the end. Shall we do that? Okay, yeah, I'm almost done anyway, so um, okay. I'll just go through these last ones and then we can discuss. Great. Um, okay, so yes, once you're in the field, um, you've found your fixes, you found your sources, you've made good friends, you know, you're an expert in your story. Um, when you're coming back and you're writing, um, just, just a few really basic tips. Um, um, uh, yes, know your audience. Um, this is something I always thought about in Haiti because Haiti had this like very active Twitter sphere. Um, and so every single story that came out in the international media about Haiti had like a whole like, you know, peanut gallery talking about it. So you have to make sure that when you when you publish this story that um, you know, the people who know everything about Haiti, they're not going to be like, eh, why are you saying that? You know, like, why are you, you know, like, how dare you say this thing about our history or whatever? You know, you don't mess it up because people who know your topic are going to be reading your topic. And it's just embarrassing, you know, if, you, if you're kind of making generalizations or, or saying things that, that people know not to be true. And, like, the best stories, the best compliments about stories is that, is that you know, it's accessible to someone who knew nothing about your topic. And it's also, there's a lot of, like, gems and, like, kind of hidden, like, you know, jokes for the people who actually know what you're talking about. Um, so yeah, but then also obviously um, a lot of people are not who are, who are going to read your story don't know anything about what you're what you're writing about, and it's important to write for them as well. Um, a great tip one editor gave me was um, assume always that your reader is smarter than you think, but knows less than you think. So just be really clear. Um, also, okay, really really important point going back to earning trust and kind of communicating with the people in the field. Um, you're just always assume, no matter how remote you are, that the people that you're writing about are going to read the piece that you write. Um, so um, even if that seems totally outlandish and like it's never going to happen, like this is 2015 and like it definitely will at some point. Um, and so, um, you know, be careful. Like when you have a 15-year-old rape victim in random, you know, rural Nepal and your editor is like, oh, what's her name? Where does she live? 
don't give it. Don't give it. Um, there are there are ethical rules about this. Um, you know, you're supposed to protect the identities of survivors of sexual assault. Um, and for some reason, people think that that doesn't apply to poor people in other countries. Um, it does. Um, so so you know, be and it, and if you're you know, explain to your to the people in the field. Um, you know, even if they don't know what the New York Times is, you need to be able to explain to them like. Lots and lots of people outside of your country are going to be reading this, and people in your country will as too. Will too. How are you comfortable being identified? Um, it's it's so important. Nick Kristoff, who's a famous New York Times columnist, got in a lot of trouble for identifying a you know I think a teenage um, survivor of sexual assault in in DRC a few years ago, and he was like, oh, she'd never read it. Like, come on, of course she will. This is 2015. So. Um, <coughs> Um, this is another just kind of philosophical idea that I have. I really think that no one is crazy and like no one is a straightforward bad guy. So try not to write your stories in black and white. Um, like we're journalists, we're not advocates, so it's not our jobs to, I don't really believe in like, um, kind of gotcha journalism. Um, well, especially when you're talking about kind of these like deep cultural issues, like, you know, the, 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 person who's marrying off his daughter when she's 11, he's not a bad person for doing that, even though we, like, as a, you know, Western feminist, maybe you're going to think that that's a bad thing to do. Um, for me, like, I'm a journalist for a reason. I'm a journalist because I'm really interested in, in understanding people, not just advocating um, and telling, or, and, and not to tell people what to do. So it's my job to really understand why that, that father is making that choice um, and, and kind of under what um, conditions he's making those choices and, and believing that he's not crazy um, and understanding you know why he's making that choice and then what the implications of that are and you know how that affects different people and all of that so just just understand your perpetrators um, and yeah and just in general don't otherize your sources it's kind of the same thing just no one is crazy so try to really understand um, your people uh, the people in your in your story and, and give them a full kind of identity in your piece as much as you can. Um, and then once you once you publish your pieces, um, you know, share as best you can. This gets you back to the whole cycle. This helps you brand yourself as someone who writes on whatever it is that you're writing about. You know, get your Twitter going, get, put it on your up on your Facebook, send it back to people who, who you interviewed in the story. People always love that. Um, and send it along to organizations that might be interested. This can kind of help you build up, you know, a reputation reporting what you're reporting on. And then um, yeah, be collegial. This is um, so important. There, I mean, there's there's no reason to be competitive, especially when you're writing on something like human rights. Um, you know, if you know, I I talk to people all the time who are like, hey, I'm going to you know some country that they found out that I worked in, and you know, just take the time, just always take the time. Or people who are just starting, like take the time, just talk to them. Um, anybody, you know, because we rely on the generosity and information of people, so many different people all over the world. So. Um, so yeah, be be generous with your information, and um, you know, yeah, get you know, let people. You know, I was so excited. The story that I was reporting in Nepal is on chalpati, which is the kind of ostracization of women who are menstruating. Um, it's a traditional Hindu practice specific to a specific region of Western Nepal. Um, and after we did this story, it was a Pulitzer Center story and published in several major medias, and. Um, you know, so many people have started reporting it since then, and I just think that's awesome. Like, that's so fantastic. Like, that's not my story. I shouldn't be possessive about it. I think it's really great that now it's being reported by, you know, in in by other photographers and other media, and like documentaries are coming and magazine stories. That's what you want. You want more more discussion about the topic that we're writing about. So, um, yeah. And in that vein, be in touch. This is my email. Um, if you have any more questions, Twitter, everything like that. All right. Questions now? Okay. Um, hello again, Elaine. Um, yeah, let me just pull up. Um, we have a grab bag of questions here at the end. Um, Alexandra Radu, she's a photographer, Romanian photographer based in Asia right now. She asked twice about. Um, Elaine, can you hear us? Oops, sorry, I missed you, but OK, I'm back.
Hello. Hi. Hi, can you hear now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. Sorry, what was the question? Right, yeah, we, we, yeah, we had a question from Alexandra Radu. She's room. She said, how do you get access as a freelance and access to the store with Papua? And then she also wanted to know uh, how you dealt with that situation in Nigeria, um, dealing with very sensitive issues that clearly the government wants to censor. Uh, and she also asked about oil. Uh, presumably, maybe she's thinking about Shell. I mean, how do you as a freelancer, without the support of a media organization, getting access to hypersensitive stories? How, um, wait, sorry, I don't think I follow. How I get access to the sensitive stories? As a yeah, she's basically figure? saying, yes, and in, uh, particularly when it's clearly a subject um, where the government is trying to censor um, or, or restrict access to access by journalists. For example, you know, the conflicts you've had in um, Nigeria between Shell and, and local communities or things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, it's tough. It's different in every situation. And I have to say, I have not worked in any un country where they're like jailing journalists for reporting on, you know, sensitive topics. Like, so if, you know, in Egypt, you should be talking to people, you know, if you're going to be working in a country that has a history of that, you should be talking to people on the ground about what to report on and what not to and, you know, weigh your risks carefully. Um, that's just a really important caveat. Um, I don't really think it's, you know, whatever. You, you have to weigh your own risks, but I, for me, it's not really worth it. Um, but how I do it in places where, yeah, the government is not really super keen on the kind of doing, um, but I don't think I'm going to get, you know, thrown in jail for 20 years. Um, I generally do all, I save my government uh, interviews for last on stuff like that. When we did the abortion story, I didn't interview anyone in the government until my last week in Nigeria, at which point I had already found my entire story. Um, and at that point, you're just getting a comment, and then they're not kind of tracking you for the rest of the time. So that's that's one way. Um, yeah, like report it, report it from the bottom up, I guess, because local communities are usually pretty into it, um, into you reporting on those kinds of stories. So well, while the lights are out, but anyway. Um, yeah, I okay, guess that was my main yeah. um, This is from Alexandra Dimitrianova. She's also based in Asia, and she's saying that there's a lot of competition among journalists. So how do you balance a willingness to help out other journalists with the same stories and topics without being taken advantage of? Um, yeah, that's interesting. I haven't worked well. Mm, yeah, I mean, if you're working for a different media and you have your own angle, um, I, you know, I don't, I, I have that not experienced as much people trying to steal stories. I mean, people have stolen a couple of my stories, I guess, but it just doesn't seem that important if it's an important story to me. Um, but yeah, if you're in an environment where people are, um, you know, if, I don't know, if you have some really important kind of access or something and, and you feel that people are going to take it, yeah, you can, you can be a little more reticent with that. But for overall, like, you know, sharing of resources, sharing of fixer, sharing of, you know, general knowledge, I think it's always best to be collegial. But yeah, I mean, hold yourself. If you know that there's someone who, who has a tendency to kind of take stories and you have some that you're brewing, just kind of eh, be vague about it. Okay, and here's a question that came up a couple times um, in, in reference to this guy who was annoying you. Um, what are the challenges and dangers of being a female journalist working in male-dominated societies? Uh, yeah, welcome to my life. Um, it's I see you're in the dark. Uh, At least I'm in the dark that. now. So yeah, here's a, here's me with the flashlight on my face. Um, uh, you know, I don't know. I think I think being a woman journalist. Um, 
I, I mean, I have male journalist friends who are like, God, I wish I was a woman who gets so much easy access to stuff because people just think you're dumb and like they'll just tell you anything and they want to hang out with you anyway. And so they'll just take you out. And I, I mean, I do find that to be a little bit true. So like, yeah, this super annoying dude who's hassling me, like actually is a really great source. So, you know, I can be like, um, sorry, not going to date you, but let's talk about petrol. Um, so, you know, I, I, I also think it's exhausting though, and I think it's really, you know, annoying, and I've had people sexually harass me on the job, like, numerous times, and, and it's, you know, it gets really, really tiring. So I think, um, uh, it's just, it's just a matter of, you know, having a good support network for when that kind of thing happens, like, carrying yourself in a professional way, um, and, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the good and the bad, um, and as long as, you know, I mean, make sure that you're safe, like, make sure that when you're going into, um, y I mean, I've had, I've, yeah, I mean, I I've had friends who were, you know, like, you know, people kind of uh, made moves on them in the middle of an interview in an office, and, like, you don't think when you're going into, like, a lawyer's office that you need to be careful and watch your back, but it's good to have, you know, it's good that if people know where you're going, it's good that, you know, if you're going someplace new that you've never been before, um, I'll usually go with like, a driver that I know, um, so you know someone has my back. You know, try to try to have someone have your back when you're going in places with people you don't know, um, and and just be assertive, man. If people are like stepping over your boundaries, just be a bitch. You know, like you don't have to you don't have to put up with people harassing you, um, and yeah, you kind of have to stand up for yourself. Okay. Um... Another question here about making stories interesting to an audience, um, let's say, that's often uninterested or even indifferent. Um, for example, um, I mean, you've dealt with this in the United States, obviously. Some of our participants are, are writing for media outlets that um, aren't um, that interested in foreign stories uh, and not particularly interested in the um, Human human rights stories or stories about the um, members of minority groups or indigenous peoples in developing countries, and so I guess the idea is you know this goes back a bit to pitching, but how do you make that story interesting to outlets and also perhaps for I mean obviously of course for readers too. Yeah. Um. I mean, I. I, mean, I everything, everything is interesting. Is interesting. Sorry, it's echoing Sorry, a lot. Can, echoing you, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. can people hear me? Um, uh, were you able to hear me? I could hear you. I could hear you. But now that you took but your headphones off, I'm hearing you too. Yeah, okay. Sorry. You made it crazy. You made it crazy. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, I'll leave it. Okay, I'm just saying, I think people have heard the question. So go carry on if you wouldn't answer it. Okay. Um, yeah, how do you make it interesting? I, I believe that anything that is well written is interesting regardless of what it's written about. So, um, I mean, if if your editors, you know, and I know that, you know, pitching actual news editors, they're not interested in the art of the story quite so much, but, um, you know, I think that if you can kind of make everything into a human drama, like, that, that's really interesting um, in general. Um, I think... Yeah, and make your characters into real humans. Like, people will want to read that and will follow it through. Um, I think other ways are, you know, people will ask you to kind of connect the story back to something that's going on in your country. Um, there's always kind of links between issues that we read abroad, we read about abroad, and, and issues that are going on at home. Um, so if you have to kind of make your pitch kind of, you know, here, we're dealing with, you know, the abortion issue in the U.S. South and it's going on in Nigeria in this crazy way. What if, you know, you can you can frame your story in that way by tying it back to people here. You can tie it back to communities um, that are in your country, you know, tying it into immigrant communities. Um, yeah, there, I mean, there's all different ways to kind of make those links. And you just have to know kind of what makes people tick, um, what makes your editor tick. And so if your editor has, like, a soft spot for, I don't even know, something... Um, you can, you know, I know I, I heard I have a friend who works for a, a newswire who wanted, um, who would only let her go and report a story on um, um, the the border between Morocco and Spain, and um, and it's really really crazy. Um, I think the most extreme economic inequality across borders in the world. Um, 
if she would do a travel story on Morocco at the same time, you know? So she did both. And she got her, like, hard-hitting human rights story, and she also, like, went, like, to, to the spas in Morocco. And so that's another way to negotiate as well. Okay, I would like to ask a question. Uh, I know you, you were working with a talented photographer, um, Alison, um, I've forgotten her last name. Um, really? Yeah, um, but now I don't think she's there in Lagos with you. Um, you know, as a writer, um, how, how far do you have to go to be sure you have pictures in, in a media environment so dominated now by, by various forms of visual communication? Um, are you, do you need to take photographs yourself? Or how do you find photographers? Do you, do you find local people to do it? Uh, are you still doing multimedia things? Uh, in the past, you've done documentaries. Um, what are you doing now that um, Allison's not around? Yeah, um, I'm on a writing fellowship now, so I'm mostly focusing on writing for myself, and I'm shooting my own pictures, kind of to go along with it. But like, they're not. I mean, I'm not a professional, but I really enjoy photography. But I'm not a professional, so um, right now it's it's a lot less pressure because I'm kind of on like a sabbatical of sorts. But um, but that being said, I um, I'm connecting with local photographers here. I have tons of local photography friends, actual actually. Um, and um, I just uh, started a new, you know, project that I'm working on with an international, with a Dutch photographer who's in town here. Um, yeah, I mean, the best, the best, the best, the best, like, combination is excellent writing with excellent photography. So um, I'm always looking for collaboration. You want to be careful when you, when you, just before deciding to collaborate with someone, but just to make sure that you kind of work in the same way. But um, yeah, I, I think it's a great way. It's you know, collaborating with local photographers is a great way because they can kind of almost be a fixer for you too. Um, and uh, yeah, but I, I do I do take pictures from time to time as well. Though I think that there should be more division of labor, and so I try to work with photographers when I can. Okay, well we're coming near just about to the end of our webinar. Um, uh, Elaine, are there things you would like to add at this point? Uh, is there something that you've asked, you've answered tons of questions, but is there something in the back of your mind that you still want to share with um, our group? Um, I, th I think that was, I think that's a good little overview of how to get abroad on short trips. Um, I guess I would say even better is if you can move abroad. The best stories are from people who actually uh, live in their countries and, and know the places inside and out. Um, so. If you ever get the chance, I recommend it. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, any questions, please do get in touch. Um, I know this is a bit rushed, so. Okay, I mean, is it is it okay for participants to email you if they have further questions? Yeah, yeah, my email is there, so. Okay, I'll be great. Well, thanks for sharing that with us, and uh, thanks for an uh, thanks for an outstanding webinar under. Less than ideal technical conditions. Um, I, I, it's been a pleasure, as always, uh, Elaine. And um, we have a tradition. Um, we can't applaud, but we can all hit our smiley button and uh, say agree. So clap, clap. Thanks so much, Elaine. And we'll be logging off now. But uh, let's do stay in touch. And best of luck with your projects there in Lagos and your fellowship. OK, great. Thank you. Thank okay, you bye -bye. so much. Bye. Okay, take care.